In the Gospel according to Matthew at chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, we'd like to read a parable beginning at verse 24, ending at verse 30. Then we'll drop down to verse 36 and read the interpretation through verse 43. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Verse 36 says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away, and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. He shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. You hear this last sentence. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. It would take too long to go back and review over the things we've had in the messages, and if you have just come into this series of messages, you'll just have to bear with us if you can't follow us for a little while until we get to the heart of his message. But all of the passages of Scripture in the New Testament that prophesy of things yet future tell us that in the last days, that is, just previous to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth again to judge, and to set up the rule of the kingdom of heaven over earth. That the world will experience a time of religious deception. Time would fail to read the many portions of Scripture that we have studied together that have proven this. The end times which we are experiencing now are to end in a time of great religious deception. A time when men universally will hold forth a form of the gospel, but will deny its power. When they will put on an outward profession of Christianity and possess not the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the life. We are told in the word of God that this time will end in such deception that men will rise up everywhere crying, Here is Christ, there is Christ. And the purpose of their preaching will be to get true believers to go after them. Jesus said, don't go after them. And he said this deception would be so great that if it were possible, even saved people would be deceived by it. And the deception would be so great that people would imagine that everybody was a Christian when in fact the Word teaches us that many are called and the few are chosen. This is a hard truth for the believer to lay hold of. We would like to think that every man who says, Lord, Lord, is saved. 
We'd like to believe that every man who has joined church, every man who has made a profession, every man who has shown any outward evidence of change in his life is really saved. And this has a tendency for to make our love grow cold. But it is not so. And I think one of the great evidences of the existence of this deception in our time is our almost inability to accept the fact of it. In other words, we hear and we listen and we read the scriptures, but sometimes we shake our head and say it must not be that all about us is hypocrisy. Yet, as we pointed out this morning, saving faith, and I'm going to repeat this because I think it's one of the greatest truths you can learn, that saving faith, faith that saves, is nothing more and nothing less than the heart falling in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And he first loved us before the world began. But this love was not manifest, nor was it revealed to us until he came from glory. And when he came down from glory into a world of woe, it was his eternal love that took him to Gethsemane's great decision, Gethsemane's agony, the tasting of the cup of death, and on to Calvary, not merely to die physically, to give up his eternal life, to be plunged into outer darkness where there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, to go to hell in the sinner's place, to taste the fires of God's wrath, to die forsaken, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This was the proof of the sincerity of his love. And having loved his own, he loved them unto the end, from the highest heights to the deepest depths, from the pinnacles of glory to the depths of hell. This eternal love of the Lord Jesus Christ carried him. And in this, his love was proven. And the way men get saved is to see their need of a Savior. They come to the conviction of sin, realize that they're lost, doomed, and Christless, and damned, and realize that if a just God gave them what they deserved, they would spend eternity in hell. Then they look at Calvary, and they're made to realize that Jesus received at God's hand all they deserved. And seeing this great eternal love, their hearts are given over to him in the response of love. And you can go through the New Testament and whatever word is used to explain what happens in a man's heart when he's saved. Call it faith. Call it believe. Call it trust. Say it's receive, accept, repent, whatever you want to use. I think you'll find that every one of those words are resident and find their fulfillment in love. You can't love without trusting, and you can't love without believing, and you can't love without committing, and you can't love without receiving that one you love. You can't love and hold back the heart or its emotions. And when sinners get saved, they fall in love with Jesus. And it is that love for Jesus that keeps them saved, keeps calling them back, keeps drawing them close, keeps them walking with him. They cannot stand his look when he looks at them as he did to Peter and holds forth his wounded hands and says, Peter, lovest thou me? The saved man must bury his head in shame and cry, Lord, Thou knowest that I love thee. The erring saint cannot stand the glance of the Lord Jesus as he passes through Pilate's judgment hall, lest he go out and weep bitterly or his sin. This is the fruit of love. And the very proof 
that we are in the time of great deception is found in the very fact that in the midst of such gospel activity as we have today, there are very few who really and sincerely love the Lord Jesus. They love church. They love program. They love activity. They love profession. They love their works. But very few who really love the Lord Jesus and whose delight and pleasure is to just simply speak of him, not his things, not his possessions, just he himself. And I think the real believer is manifest in the various believers of the Bible. And I like that one facet of the believer's heart that's made plain in Mary Magdalene, who cried, They've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. It was he himself she wanted, Jesus that she loved. And again, the believer's heart is seen in the woman who dashed in out of the night and broke her alabaster box at the precious feet of Jesus. She didn't care what the Pharisees thought of her. She wasn't interested in the Pharisees' doctrine, wasn't interested in joining the church, wasn't interested in what the town thought. She didn't care anything about whether it was proper or not to do what she did driven by the fires of love, reason overruled by the passion of her heart. She did what was unorthodox and what religion scoffed at and condemned her for. She lay down at the feet of Jesus and professed her love for him. This is real saving faith, the heart falling in love with Jesus. And again I repeat it because it's worthy of repetition. Salvation is a personal thing, something that takes place in the heart between the sinner and the Lord Jesus Christ. If I never get to this parable, may I ask you, have you fallen in love with Jesus? Remember the little maiden in the Song of Solomon who ran out into the street looking for her beloved, down into the streets of Jerusalem in the night hour, crying out, Have you seen my beloved? One of them stopped her and said, What's your beloved above another? What makes him so great? She stopped there on the street and began to tell the glories and the beauty of her beloved. This, brethren, is real witnessing. It has nothing to do with doctrine. It has nothing to do with creed. It has nothing to do with position. It's the heart telling about one they love. Have you fallen in love with Jesus? Is he your beloved? This is saving faith. And I believe it's a rare commodity in these closing days, don't you? Now let's go back to the parable. I like to think of a setting sometime. I sat down and I try to just imagine the context of this parable. We miss a lot by not putting ourselves in the place of those who are hurting. We read the Bible from a detached point of view too often. We need to get right in the shoes of those people hurting speak these words and react as they might have reacted and think like they might have thought to understand what the Lord Jesus was trying to say to them. These are parables. He spoke often in parables to the multitude. He had a purpose in that. A parable is a story, a make-up story, a fictional story. It's just an allegory. He tells a story, but in this story he couches divine truth. He hides the facts of eternal truth in the story. Then he says, let those who have an ear to hear, hear it. That is, if the heart is open, the Holy Spirit will reveal the meaning to you. And if the heart is not open, what the ears have heard will be unintelligible. And be careful when you hear the word of God preached in the power of the Holy Spirit that you don't reveal what's really in your heart by saying, I couldn't understand it. Because when you say, I can't understand it, you've only confessed that your heart was closed to believe it. And divine truth in the parables 
was so hidden so that those whose hearts were closed against him would find nothing of interest, but those whose hearts were open would enter fully into the blessed truth of the story. The story starts out, the context is this. A great multitude had come to hear him teach. Since it's spring, I like to imagine that it might have been spring on the day that he preached this. Now, why would I say it might be spring? Speculation. Not altogether. He teaches a parable about a sower who sowed his field. And when do sowers sow their field? Well, most of the crops are sown in the spring. And I like to think it might have been spring because the multitudes were outside. And they pressed upon him. And he went down to the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. I see him going, and I hear the crowd pressing him. Master, teach us. Will you give us something today? What do you have for us? Talk to us about the things of God. And the multitude was so great that he stepped into a little boat down at the seashore. And the little boat was cast off from shore, and it became his pulpit. And the multitude sat down on the seashore, or stood, whichever was convenient. And he began to speak to them. And somehow or another, I like to think that off in the distance, perhaps from a place that no eye could see but him, he saw a sower sowing his field. Perhaps yonder, behind the crowd, up against the hill, was the farmer. He'd gone to a flesh, freshly plowed field. And here he walks about his field, scattering the seed. And I like to think that some of the parables were born this way from living examples that men could understand and could see. And perhaps the Lord looked up against the hillside and then he said to them, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who has sowed good seed in his field. That's what it's like. Now the kingdom of heaven is a general term. Let's just say that he's talking about the profession, this great sphere of professing Christianity, and what's going to happen to it in the end times. It's like this. This good man went out in his field to sow his seed, and he sowed it. Later, obviously at night, while men slept, that is, the good man and his servants, his enemy came along. And his enemy trespassed. He went right into that field where he had no right. And he did something dastardly. He did a very wicked, vicious thing. We'd call it in our language a right down dirty trick. He sowed weed seed all over that man's field after he'd labored so hard. And get this after he had finished his work. This wicked enemy came in and he sowed seed all over it. And the seed was called tares. Darnell, or darnel is the word. And the rabbis used to call it bastard wheat because it looked like wheat, professed to be wheat, but wasn't wheat at all. They called it degenerate wheat, wicked wheat. And he sowed this all over the field. Nobody knew about it. In fact, when it began to come up with the wheat, nobody knew about it. Because it's impossible when this first comes up to tell it from the true wheat. But there came a time when the difference was made plain and the plan of the enemy was manifest for all to see. When it was discovered that a wicked enemy had done something to spoil the harvest of the good man, it didn't come until fruit time. But at fruit time, the tares were made manifest. The servants looked out upon the field, and what they had thought was all wheat turned out to be some wheat and some tares. And they were frustrated and perplexed and they ran back to the good man 
And they said, Lord, I thought you sowed good wheat in that field. I said, I did. Well, then where did the tares come from? And the good man seemed to know all about it. And he said, an enemy hath done this. And they said immediately, well, we'll go out and we'll root up all these tares. And he said, no, leave them stand together. And I like this phrase, until harvest time. Oh, brethren, there's a harvest time coming. There's a harvest time coming when the servants will rejoice. For the good man has angels, the reapers, and they will come. And the reapers alone know the tares from the wheat. And they will go through his field. And they will separate the wheat from the chaff and from the tares. And they will take the tares and they will bind them in bundles in the last days. In the end of the age, the Greek says. But the wheat, all oh, the wheat is going to be gathered up into the good man's barn. Isn't that a wonderful story? Now there's something interesting about this story. Lots of things, of course. This is not the only parable he taught in this setting. That is from his little pulpit in the boat. He taught some other parables. But after the multitude had gone away and they'd gone back into the house, the disciples came to him. This is in verse 36. And out of all that he taught, there was something that interested them and something that stayed with them. They couldn't understand this story of the tares. And privately they said to him, Lord, declare unto us the parable of the tares. And I thank God that any honest believer who doesn't understand the word of God, if he's willing to receive and believe it, he can simply go to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, I heard what you said, and I want to receive it, but I don't understand it. Make it plain to me. He will. For he said, write down, and he said, well, it's very simple. And this is the part I like because nobody has to guess what this parable means. And nobody has to speculate what it means. And not a man, woman, boy, or girl, can leave this building tonight and say, that's his interpretation of the parable. It is not my interpretation. It is the interpretation of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he said that story meant. He said the field of the good man was the world. You know there's different words in the Greek for world. This one happens to be the word which means mankind, the human race. And this good man, he said, was the son of man. Who is the son of man? Jesus. Jesus was the good man. What a good man he was. And what a good man he is. And this good man, came into the field, into the race, to do a work. And he did his work. It was finished when he sowed the seed and left the field again and went back to his father's house in glory. The seed was not the gospel. He said the seed was the children of the kingdom. They were saved people. When he went back to glory, let me tell you the first fruits of that harvest had already been reaped. He had finished his work, sowed the seed of men and women who had been brought into a saving relationship with his father through his finished work. And he said that bad man, that evil man, that enemy was the devil. And the devil went right out behind him after he'd finished his work and went out in the human race and he sowed tares. And he said the tares were children of that wicked one, children of the devil. Now, brethren, let us examine this parable. First, I want to say this about the field. It is referred to as his field. 
I like that, don't you? Do you know who the human race belongs to? Belongs to Jesus. He bought them with his own blood. In John 12, when he talked about going to the cross, he said that if he was lifted up, that he would draw all men unto himself. And he spoke of his death. The human race was twice his, like a little boy with his book. Once because he made them, twice because he bought them. It was his field. He had every right to go out into that field. And he had every right to do what he did. And he did it in the hopes of a harvest. He did it against the day when with joy he'd bring his sheaves into his barn. This is a picture in the scriptures given again in Psalm 124 of the day when the precious souls for whom Christ died, who received him as their Savior, are going to be gathered into that eternal barn, that place of safety, that place of refuge in his Father's house. And oh, what a day it will be for the sower, the good man who went out into the field and by the sweat of his face, and the hope of the future. He did a work that one day will bring him a blessed return upon his labors. This field was his. And the good seed he sowed in the human race are those who have come to know him as their Savior. And this might be a word of encouragement to you. You have been placed in the human race where you are by the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. No chance brought you where you are tonight. No victim of circumstances is the believer. The bounds of your habitation have been set. The appointments of your life have already been made. We move and have our being in a place chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I didn't believe that, it would be awful hard for me to maintain any constant joy when I get tired of the place I'm in, the circumstances I'm in, the burden I'm under, the place in life where I find myself. And oftentimes I sit down and feel like I, I don't know who is me, if you know what that means. I sit down and I say, who am I? I'd like to be somebody else. I'd like to just be removed from this place I am in the race. And I'd like to be someplace else geographically. I'd like to be someplace else nationally. And I'd like to be someplace else something else. But I remember that I am here by no chance. I wasn't born raised in Pardersburg within a stone's throw of this building for no reason. I wasn't brought into the family I was brought into for no reason at all. And when the Lord saved me, I found myself in a place in His field where He put me and where He could use me. For He put me in this place in His field for one reason, to bear fruit against that day of harvest. And I tell you, that will lift you out of that uh, lost identity feeling when you sit down and think you're a square peg in a round hole, you're not. Remember, the hand of the Lord Jesus placed you where you are. Now, think on that from either end and draw from it whatever conclusions you want to. But I'm satisfied that if we submit ourselves to the Lord, we'll find our place in the field where he wants us and where he sowed us. And where he placed us. Do you realize, brethren, that each one of you tonight have a sphere of influence, have a circle of acquaintances that can be reached for Jesus that I can't reach at all? Do you know that you have a place of ministry that the greatest minister in the world cannot enter into? Do you know that there are heart doors open to you that are closed to me? Homes open to you that will never open their doors to me or to another. 
Every man has his Decapolis, and to that Decapolis every converted demon-possessed man is sent back to tell his friends what great things the Lord hath done for him. And oh, how we need to take advantage of that place we're in, in this field. He put us there. I find no fault with what he does. You men who work in the plant, I know it must be hard. And you must get discouraged. And you must feel like life is awful futile. You go and you come and you carry a lunch bucket. But remember that you're occupying a precious place in the field. A place where you alone can bear fruit. Where you alone can be used of Jesus. Where no other man can fit. Works ordained for you before the foundation of the world. Works that he wants you to walk in for his glory and for his praise. This is a serious and sobering thought, isn't it? And it can cause the very droll and drab circumstances of our life to take on a new glory when we realize that, like I heard in a poem 18 years ago, just a few weeks after I was saved, I was wondering what could God do with a square peg like me in the round holes in this world. And I was wondering about what he was ever going to do with such a big misfit as me. And I heard this poem quoted. And do you know poems are scriptural? I will not take the time to prove it to you. But there are spiritual songs. That's poetry. Which express spiritual truths. And I heard this poem quoted over the air one morning when I was very discouraged and I don't remember anything else excepting the last line and it said remember no other man can do the work that God cut out for you that's a true statement brother from the hand of the Lord Jesus we have fallen into this place let us make the most of it let us work in this corner of the field while it is yet day the night will come when we cannot work. And the harvest will come when we cannot bear any more fruit. Let us then be faithful where God has put us, always abounding, steadfast in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labors are not in vain in the Lord. They are not. The Lord of the harvest placed us here. And the Lord of the harvest knows all about our place here. And brethren, what we need is not a change of circumstances. We need a change of heart. It isn't a geographical change that we need when we get in the doldrums. It's a spiritual change. We need to get our eyes off ourselves, off our circumstances, and onto him who placed us here. Know that the circumstances are all of his own blessed making. All right? The field was his. He put the seed in the field as it pleased him. Did you ever saw a field? If you did, you can't argue with the fact that he put the seed where he wanted it, can you? When you see a bare spot and you're sowing the field, what do you do? Run over and give it a shot. You know where that seed's going and where you want it. And he sowed his field the same way. And he placed his seed right where he wanted it, put it in the ground right where it pleased him, went to the house when his work was finished, sat down at his father's right hand, and is waiting for you to bear fruit where he planted you, waiting against that day of harvest. Now, is that all I want you to do? Yep. Just bear fruit. That's all. And then more fruit. And then much fruit. For this is the joy of the farmer. To see the rich increase of his seed. What has he given you to do? Nothing but bear fruit. What is it to bear fruit? Bear the fruit of his life. The fruit of the Spirit. Just do what comes naturally to seed. Bear the fruit of the life that it has. And that life is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's talk about the enemy. The enemy was Satan. What about Satan? Well, he works at night. He's called the prince of the power of the air, but he's also the prince of darkness. He works at night while men sleep. He's tricky and he's cunning. 
He's deceitful. And he's wicked. And only the devil could think of such a dastardly thing to do as this man thought of. And there is something else about this enemy that you need to know. He went into the Lord's field where he had no business to go. The devil is a squatter. And he's working a field that doesn't belong to him. And his purpose is not to have a harvest for himself, but to spoil the harvest the good man wanted for himself. And there's something else that's said here about the devil. He's not the enemy of the Christian. Did you know that? He's the enemy of Jesus. His enemy came. The devil wasn't mad at the wheat. The devil was mad at the good man. The devil didn't set himself against the wheat. He set himself against the good man. And we get egotistical when we think that we're so important that the devil devotes all his time to us. The devil doesn't feel anything for you. He couldn't care less what happens to you. You are nothing to him. You are a speck of dust. He is the enemy of Jesus. And wherever Jesus is manifest, he'll work on that man, he'll work on that woman, that boy, that girl. Wherever Jesus sows his good seed, he'll get in there and sow his bad seed. He'll do anything he can to aggravate the Lord Jesus Christ. He hates him. This is a personal matter between Satan and and the Son of God. And the devil wants one thing. He wants to spoil the joy of harvest time. Can't do it. Thank God for the reapers like the old cavalry that always, always comes about the time the good guys are getting it from the Indians. The reapers are going to come one of these days just when it looks like the good man's field has been taken over by the bad man trickery. The reapers will appear and these reapers, oh, what power they have. They know the tares from the wheat. And they go through that field why, like a bunch of locusts. And the tares are bound in bundles. And they're set aside in the wheat. Every precious stock of that wheat is gathered up and carried into the barn of the good man. I like the way the story ends. The good guy wins, and the bad guy gets what's coming to him. Now, let us go on. Talk about the tares. Tares are said to be children of the wicked one, unsaved. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that when the, when the Bible speaks of a child of the devil, I think it means more than just a plain unsaved person. Because I find that Jesus only used it when he described the religious hypocrite. The Pharisee, who drew nigh with his mouth and with his lips, and his heart was far from God. He said, Ye are of your children, the devil. And here he speaks of the tear, the hypocrite, the phony counterfeit wheat that stands in the field with the wheat and pretends to be wheat. And passes himself off as wheat to all who observe the field. He is said by the Lord Jesus to be the child of the wicked one. Because I want to tell you something. The devil's method is deceit. It's trickery. It's cunningness. And you have to confess that the devil never conceived anything more effective than the counterfeit Christian. He never conceived anything as effective as the tares sowed among the wheat who passed themselves off as true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and whose real nature can only be discerned by the reapers at harvest time. Now, hear this. While men slept, his enemy came, verse 25, and sowed tares. Where did he sow? Among the wheat. Now, if the tares had been sowed along the side of the road, 
no one would have ever thought them to be wheat. But when they were placed in the wheat field, they were readily accepted as wheat. You say a hypocrite can't be a hypocrite unless he's in the realm of professing Christianity. There are no hypocrites outside professing Christianity. The man who doesn't profess to be a Christian, though he's wicked and ungodly, could never be called a hypocrite. Never could he be referred to as a tear. He's not pretending to be anything but what he is, and that's ungodly and wicked. But what about the man or the woman who stands with the wheat, stays in the wheat field, looks like the wheat, talks like the wheat, acts like the wheat, lives like the wheat, is nourished on the same nourishment the wheat is nourished on, goes through all the motions that the wheat go through. And down deep in his heart is a bastard son of God. Degenerate and unregenerate. Unsaved and lost. Posing as a Christian. For he thinks Christianity is something you put on outwardly like a suit of clothes and take off at will. And Christianity is more than that. Salvation is something that's put on within. It's a transformation. It's a change in the nature. A change in the very heart of a man. It's something that makes him to be no longer the same man but a new creature in Jesus Christ. Born again. Born over again. No man can do anything about the circumstances under which he was born in this life. But every man can be born anew. He can be born into the family of God. And the tear is the professing Christian who does not possess the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ and who has never been saved by simple faith in the Son of God. Now, they are sown among the wheat for confusion, for deception, to spoil the harvest time, but all fruit time will reveal who they are. <laughs> for you see, the time of fruit came. And when the time of fruit came, the servants were able to tell the difference. For they looked around and there was a difference in the field. And you know what the difference between Tares and wheat is at fruit time. They both bear fruit, as they do. The darnel wheat, or the bastard wheat, as the rabbis call it, it heads up just like real wheat. All the fruit isn't of the quality of the real wheat. In fact, it's bitter. In fact, actually, chemically analyzed, it is a very strong poison. And birds eat it, and some of them get dizzy and drunk, and some of them die from eating that wheat. It's food for thought. Isn't it? And another difference is not only in the taste of the fruit, which is bitter and is poisonous, so much so that if there are tares in a wheat field, the old timers in the eastern, over in the east, used to go through the wheat almost grain by grain picking out the tiny black grains of the tares for fear that they would poison the true grain, cause even their bread for their table to cause them to be ill. But another big difference, when the field grew to maturity and fruit time came, the true wheat laden down with fruit bowed its head. Do you ever see a wheat field ready for the harvest? And every head bowed, there was a brokenness, a humility, a bowing down of the true wheat. But the terror stands erect with his head up tall, full of fruit and glad of it and proud of it. Little does he know that all his fruit is bitter and poison. Another way of saying all his righteousness is as filthy rags. But he stands up proud of his works, proud of his fruit. 
And that's the way the servant knows the difference between the tare and the wheat. He looks out into the field of mankind, and every time he sees a man boasting in himself, proud of his works, glorying in his fruit, he knows he's a tear. For the wheat realize that if they have borne any fruit, it is only the blessed sower who is to be praised and thanked. And their heads are bowed in humility to him. And we hear from the mouth of the wheat such words as came from Paul, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And believe me, brethren, when a man has professed to be saved, we watch him long enough, and fruit time comes. And before long he betrays himself, and even the servants begin to see. And the servants, when they saw it, oh, I know how they felt. First this surge of emotion over their heart, frustration. We look out and suddenly we see those who profess to be Christians. And they're proud and they wrecked and exalting themselves. Boasted in their works. Unbowed. And oh, I believe this with all my heart. If a man's really saved, the Lord has to deal with him. And there has to be some brokenness in his life. Doesn't there? There have to be some crushing. There has to be some casting down. There has to be something of what John the Baptist said. I must decrease and he must increase. There has to be something of Christ having the preeminence in his life. Sooner or later, God will get his way. He may break him physically. He may break him under the mental pressures of his life. He may break him under adversity and tragedy, but break him he will. And in fruit time... He shows the effect of that brokenness. And there is a bowing before the sower and a joyful looking down lest he take any glory from the blessed one to whom it all belongs. And I know what those servants experienced. They were frustrated when they looked out and saw people that they thought were saved manifesting the fruit of an unregenerate heart. And they did what every servant does when he sees such a spectacle. They ran to the blessed Lord and told him about it. There isn't any place else to go. Lord, look. Look for yourself, Lord. And let me tell you something else, too. Hear me. That servant, our, those servants, they were loyal to that Lord. They loved him. And do you know those servants were deceived? They thought that whole field was pure wheat. And I fear that's what's happening, brethren, in the end time, that the servants think the whole field is filled with wheat. And they have some heartbreaking experiences ahead. For fruit time will come, won't it? And little by little they'll look out and it will begin to be evident that a wicked enemy has been at work, and he has sowed that which resembles wheat, but is not wheat. And they will run to the Lord in frustration. I've been there too many times. Lord, look at your field. Don't you care? And I know this Lord said to him and knew all about it. Not worried about it. Why? I have a plan. And I know the second experience of those servants. First, the frustration. The panic. And they run to the Lord. Lord, Lord, look out here, look. All the professors to be saved are not saved, Lord. Look at them. And the second reaction was when he said an enemy did this was a burning jealousy in their heart for their Lord. And they said, we'll go out if you say so, and we'll tear them up with the roots. And that's where all these self-commissioned, self-appointed uprooters come from. They're fighting the National Council. 
They're fighting the World Council. They're fighting the Communists. No one commission anybody to uproot the tares. Do you believe that? Let well, them stand together till harvest time. Oh, brethren, harvest time is coming. I'm so thankful for harvest time. And you know, it is my harvest. It's his. And believe you me, if a good man don't care about the tares standing in his field until them, I'm sure I don't either. And I'm not going to lose any sleep over the tares. I'm going to let them stand right there together with the believer. Because I'm sure of this. I don't know enough to go rooting through my Lord's harvest field like a hog with a ring in his nose. I know one thing I'm to do. Stand where he's put me, bear fruit, and leave the tares to him. And you know, sometimes I get to thinking about this fight communism, fight national council, fight world council, and I used to be afflicted with it, and I thank God I've been healed of that festering disease, because it'll eat the heart, the joy, and the peace of the believer right out of him. Do you know that? Turn him to bitterness. Turn him into a accusing, bitter, spiritual district attorney. And I thank God he opened my eyes to see what a negative, loveless career it really was. And I get frustrated every time I think about it. The same man who's fighting communism from a spiritual standpoint and says, let all us Christians band together and keep communism from taking over America. That same man, when he preaches on the prophecy, will preach about the inevitable fall to world communism predicted in the Bible. So he finds himself fighting against God. <laughs> Here he is working tooth and nail to keep the Antichrist from coming. But the Antichrist can't come until the church is taken away to be with Jesus. So I say let him come. The sooner the better. It's not my harvest field. It's my Lord's. If he don't care about the tares, I don't care about them. If he wants them to stand, I shall let them stand. My business is to stay where he put me in this field of mankind and do what comes naturally to any believer, yield myself to the blessed life I have within and bear what fruit I can against that day when the dear Lord who sowed me here will come in harvest time. Oh, what a day it will be in harvest time. Harvest time. Oh, it's the first reaction. Notice carefully their question, verse 28. Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And if you'll let me just paraphrase this because I'm putting it into plain English. They're asking Jesus this, is it your will? Is it your will that we be commissioned of thee to uproot the tares? Shall we go out and give ourselves to separating the tares from the wheat? That is, rooting them up out of the field and exposing them? I get a little sick and tired of these two before preachers running around all the United States with briefcase patting it gleefully and saying, as I heard one preacher say, I've got enough evidence in here to put the finger on that big preacher down at the Methodist church. Brother, he's got a ministry Christ never gave him. And a ministry he can't find in the Word of God. He has one responsibility. Stand where he is and bear fruit for Jesus and leave those terrors alone. Do you know why we're supposed to leave them alone? Because if you root those tears up, you may know who they are. You don't have to sleep with them. You don't have to eat with them. You don't have to have anything to do with them. In fact, ignore them. It is exactly what Jesus said to do with them. 
As far as I'm concerned, I don't even know who they are and what they are, and I couldn't care less. This I know. You go to rooting the tares up, you're going to hurt the wheat. You can't help but hurt the wheat. You can't help but hurt them. Why? One thing, the nature of tares is to sink down their roots, and those roots entwine with the roots of the wheat. You go to ripping up a tare, and you'll disturb the roots of a wheat. And you do that, and he won't bear fruit like he ought to. And do you know that I can look around in fundamentalism, and I can see lots of my brothers in Christ that I know are true wheat, and they're withering up. Their roots have been all disturbed, and you know what's disturbed them? They've disturbed their own roots by ripping up every tear they come into contact with. Seen it happen. Saw it happening in my own heart. It was a spiritual pride. It was that everlasting fleshly desire to prove somebody wrong and me right. You go to rooting up the tares. Believe you me, you're going to get all shook up yourself. Do you believe that? Yes, you will. You can't help but just be constantly shaken up. And my, oh my. Sheep shouldn't have anything on their minds but just grazing in deep green pasture and drinking in still waters and loving the shepherd. Do you know that? This is his business. He knows where they are. He knows what they are. He knows who they are. One of these days, he's going to send these angels. Reapers, he's going to say, go into my field, and you gather my wheat out of that field. You know who they are. You've seen their blessed names on my book of life. Now you go get them, every single one. And they're going to separate the wheat from the tares. Let them stand, he said. Let them stand, and let them stand together. Now there's two things I have to tell you before I quit. I have to read verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, I don't know what this means. And we are not to conclude anything that is not definitely revealed. So don't conclude that these two events take place at the same time. He may bind the tares in bundles a thousand years before he burns them. Because there is one thing first. After they're bound, he wants to gather wheat into his barn. He'll take care of the tares in due season. Wheat is utmost in his mind. But do you know, I'll just throw this out to you. It's something that's been occurring to me in regards to this verse. I think it is prophetically being fulfilled right now. The harvest time is out here, but before harvest time there has to be the binding of the tares in bundles, and I've never seen a time in the history of the church when the tares were working day and night at joining themselves together in bundles. Think it over. Think it over. Aren't they? Worst joining age the world's ever known anything about. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry out peddling his own particular kind of bundle. Join my bundle. And you know the funny part? Funny, as my English teacher used to say, not funny, ha ha, funny, peculiar. Do you know the peculiar thing about it? all the bundles going to the same furnace? All the bundles going to the same furnace. Isn't that what it says here? And that will be any separate furnace, it's just one. And there's not going to be any separate barn. Just one. Do you think when we reach that blessed harvest barn, it's going to say Baptist on the door? All Baptist sheep in here, or uh, wheat in here, 
Then there'll be another barn and it'll say, Oh, Methodist, wheat over here. Then there'll be another barn and it'll say, Oh, Presbyterian, wheat over here. Wheat is wheat. And it all belongs to the blessed sower of the field. Has it's the fruit of his work and he has one barn. And into that one barn will go all his wheat. It's the only barn I recognize. It's the only barn I will submit myself to. That barn is the church which is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his bride. It's that spiritual temple built of living stones. And we are the living stones for the habitation of the true God. This is the church I belong to. Not the church of the Union Hall. I belong to the church of the firstborn. The sooner we recognize that we're all going to end up in the same barn, the easier it's going to be for us to get out of the bundles we're mixed up in here. But let me tell you that tares are being bound in bundles. Now let me tell you one more thing, and then I will promise definitely to close. The Lord helping me. Or you will have to help me. Again, a parable should not be carried beyond the dear Lord's intention. His intention in this parable was to show one simple truth, that the false and the true will always be thrown together in this world, that the unsaved professing Christians will always clutter up the fellowship of, profess of real Christians, and that we'll be all entangled, and our roots do get entangled, don't they? Our family roots. We are entangled with these tares. You can't go around rooting them up without hurting yourself. You can't. Let them stand. You just stand where you are and bear your fruit. Leave it till the blessed harvest Lord comes, and he'll do the rooting up. And the burning won't be you. And this is the intention of the parable, to show the situation in professing Christian Christianity down to the end times. Now I'm going to tell you something that won't fit the parable, but it fits the Word of God. There is something the spiritual terror can experience that those real terrors in that field will never experience. Those real terrors will be terrors forever. But the spiritual terrors can be transformed into wheat. I'm not going to take the time to read them to you. Passage after passage, I looked the word up. I found passages of assurance that many of God's people today were once tares. The same word translated iniquity, which describes their sin of hypocrisy, is the same word translated transgressor when it says our blessed Lord was numbered with the transgressors. What happened to him at Calvary? He took the sin of iniquity. That religious hypocrisy that professes and does not possess. He died for that sin too. You, Titus, the third chapter tells us, were sometimes disobedient and lawless. Iniquity workers. And you look back over the history of all of us. And at one time, we were the biggest tares in the Lord's field. Weren't we? Weren't we? Come on, confess it. We stood proud and erect, and we boasted in our darnel wheat, and we poisoned everyone who partook of our fruit. And our roots were tangled up with the roots of true believers, and we were sown in our various places in this race by the devil to destroy and to disrupt. What happened? The blessed Lord did something that farmer can't do. Came along and turned us in the wheat. Isn't that a wonderful ending to that story? 
I was once disobedient. Once I was sown in the human race by the devil to poison and to destroy all who touched me. And the Lord Jesus came along transformed me. Well, how can that be? That's a miracle. Well, yes, it is, come to think of it. And it can be done because the blessed Lord is the Lord of nature and the Lord of creation. And men who are saved are new creations in Jesus Christ. And the first thing he had to do with me was not chop me down. Brother, he had to dig me up, root and everything. I had my roots down deep in this old world, and he dug me up by the roots. And he gave me an infusion of life that I'd never had before. And he sowed me in his field wheat to bear fruit for eternity. Let us be at it, and let us pray. Thank you, Father, for this time together tonight. Pray that every heart will go away receiving something of Jesus. Give us what understanding we need as we submit our hearts to these blessed truths. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.